stand. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Good Friday is from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marked beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Epistles from Hebrews, chapters 4 and 5. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, 
yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Jesus answered, 
Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? I have an answer. Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man! But Barabbas, now Barabbas was a robber. So when Pilate heard these words, 
he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified.
stand by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
instituted the feast of the Lord's Supper as a fulfillment of the Passover now goes to be sacrificed. And even though he goes willingly, he's treated no different than any other Passover lamb. He's bound and taken captive. He's led away to the priests within the temple. Various sins are laid upon him and in the most brutal ways possible. Hit, slapped, spit upon, pierced with thorns, scourged with whips, beat with reeds, mocked and accused of the greatest evil anyone could ever commit. Blasphemy. Blasphemy against Almighty God. But this is no surprise. The fact that he's treated like an animal and not a human is no shock. For Isaiah foretold it long ago, writing, His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. For the true Passover lamb had to be slain. And though Christ could have explained it all, though he could have answered every single question, though he could have revealed his great might and power and freed himself from captivity, Though he deserved absolutely none of this. Nevertheless, he goes willingly. He bears the stripes and the wounds. He bears the insults and the taunts. For his eyes, his eyes are fixed on what must be done. His eyes are fixed upon bringing salvation to his people. And so, like every Passover lamb who came before, like every lamb on the Day of Atonement who bore the sins of the people, Jesus Christ was led to an altar to be sacrificed. He was laid on the wood of an altar. The altar of the cross. Nails were driven through his hands and his feet. And he was raised up. He was raised up from the dust of the ground so that all the world could see. They could see his shame and disgrace. They could see his anguish and his suffering. They could see his wounds and his dying. They could see the Father pouring out his wrath upon his only Son. The entire world could see the chastisement that brings you peace. For truly, Christ suffers all of this for you. This is why he's willing to go to the cross. This is why he's willing to bear the stripes and the wounds. This is why he's willing to draw his final breath on this earth and give up his spirit. It's for you. It's for your salvation. It's for your very life. The truth is, you've been overcome by an enemy. An enemy you don't always see, or hear, or feel, or even recognize. An enemy whose might you can never hope to touch on your own. 
And though you may want to argue, that's not really your fault. Though you don't want to take the blame. Though you think someone else deserves the blame for sin. Though you think you might just be an innocent victim in all of this. You know that's not really true. You know that you sin daily. And in fact, that you sin more than you could ever realize. You know that far too often, sin and the desire to sin is more of a friend to you than an enemy. You love to covet. You love to lie and cheat and steal. You love to lust and hate. You love to disregard the Word of God and to place anything, everything, in fact, before your Lord. And for this, for all of this, for every single sin you commit, there is a price. There's a wage that must be paid. That price, that wage, it's death. Death, both here in this world, but also into eternity. For death stalks you every single second of your life. It's never far from you because you're a sinner. And death, death feeds on sinners. Death grabs hold of sinners and never lets them go. But now, now, dear saints, now raise your heads, lift up your eyes, and see your salvation. See your Passover lamb who sheds his blood for you. Notice how the blood of Christ on the cross turns that dreadful wood bright red. Notice how the blood of Christ on the cross marks the entryway into paradise. Notice how the blood of Christ on the cross marks the door as plain as can be so that death can see it and seeing this blood, this Passover lamb's blood, death passes over. Anyone and everyone who is found there, who is found where the blood of the lamb has been spilled. Everyone. Like you. You who are baptized into Christ. You are found at the cross because you are baptized into his death. Now, this Passover lamb's blood marks you, both on your forehead and on your heart, but it also marks your lips in the Lord's Supper. And as his blood comes to mark you, as his blood is painted on you, just as on the doors of Passover. Death sees that, and death must flee. Death must pass over you. For the blood of this Passover lamb doesn't just save you for one night, but for all eternity. The blood of this Passover lamb doesn't just give you life now, but it gives you life forever, into the ages of the ages. Dear saints, rejoice in this. Rejoice on this day. Rejoice in the blood of your Passover lamb that was shed so that death may pass over you forever. Rejoice, dear saints. Yet, 
as you rejoice over this. As you rejoice over the blood of Christ which now marks you as one who will never die. And now you look back to the cross. You turn around and behold a horrible sight. You see that while death now passes over you, death did not pass over this lamb. For sin still demanded its wage. Sin still exacted its price. The Passover lamb had to be slain. And even though you didn't have to pay, your lamb did. So you mourn. You mourn the death of this Passover lamb because you know that every other Passover lamb in the history of the world stayed dead. But this Passover lamb, well, this Passover lamb, he's different. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.
and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy so that your church, spread throughout all the nations, may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all the ministers of the Word, for all vocations in the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, Receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our Lord God would open their hearts and the door of his mercy, that, having received the remission of all their sins by the washing of regeneration, they may be mindful of their baptism and evermore be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty God and Father, because you always grant growth to your church, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that rejoicing in their new birth by the water of holy baptism, they may forever continue in the family of those whom you adopt as your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. O oh, merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hand all the might of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well, all the powers that exist in all the nations of the world. We humbly pray you graciously to regard your servants, especially Donald, our president, the Congress of the United States, Eric, our governor, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws, that all who receive the sword as your ministers may bear it according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick, and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who, are, who in any tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside of the church that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their error, call them to faith in the true and living God, and His only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and gather them into His family, the Church.
Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death, but the life of all. Hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error, and for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for peace, that we may come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord. Grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear, to the praise and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy, and graciously grant them such things as are both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. Oh, Almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own good will. O oh Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we may by your grace be made ready to receive your blessing on all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. Oh! 
out of the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross. Oh, my people! Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, leave us not to bitter death. O oh Lord, have mercy. Is this how you thank your 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.